Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all uh, to, uh, to participate uh, this session. I know this time is real uh, difficult for you to keep uh, waking up, but I hope uh, uh, we can make you, you guys to uh, continuously uh, wake up. So today I'm very honored to be able to uh, make a moderate, uh, to do a, a moderator here with a three of uh, distinguished uh, you know, panelists, uh, uh, including Cassie and Tom and John. And Cassie, I have been, uh, we have been uh, friends each other, uh, maybe uh, long enough, 25 years, right? And also, uh, the John is uh, uh, my uh, my favorite. I'm a big fan of uh, John and a good friend. And Tom is, uh, I think, uh, one of the, my best friends uh, in the United States. Well, not one, but the uh, most, uh, uh, I mean, best friend uh, in the US and uh, also my partner. So I'm very pleased to be able to uh, do a moderator with uh, for these three guys, and you know, in fact, uh, I really think this three panels is good. So uh, before we uh, talk about uh, you know startups and uh, other things today, I just wanna start with uh, their personal personal story, you know, because three of them have very unique and uh, interesting uh, personal uh, personal story. I like uh, start with Cassie. You know, Cassie, as you know, have been a uh, uh, strategist uh, at uh, uh, most recently at uh, Goldman Sachs for more than 25 years. Then she now getting a uh, uh, venture capital space. So please tell me uh, your personal story, including what made you, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, motivated uh, to get in a uh, VC space. Sure, and thank you all for joining um, our session. So in terms of the kind of journey that I have been on, as you described, I uh, retired uh, from Goldman Sachs after, actually, I just counted the other day, almost 27 years um, covering the Japanese stock market. And during that time, I spent a lot of uh, my research efforts on structural challenges facing the Japanese market, the Japanese economy, and in fact, in my kind of latter years of my career, I actually spent quite a bit of focus on corporate governance issues. You saw Murakami Ayasan. I actually met her father, the original like Japanese activist in this market when he was first starting out. And I had many activist clients when I was uh, a strategist. And while I think it's fair to say that there has definitely been some progress in improving Japanese corporate governance practices, particularly in the last few years, I did see firsthand uh, how uh, difficult uh, and challenging it was to change large established companies with incentive structures that weren't always aligned with those of shareholders to adopt these sort of global best practices. And Diversity in my womenomics research was a little bit, you know, um, related to that as well. And so when um, Yumiko Murakami, who's here, and our third partner, Miyaseki, were kind of thinking about what to do with the rest of our lives since we're all going to live to 100. Is that right? I hope. Um, and of course, given my background, I had people tell me, Kathy, you know, why venture? You should be doing an um, activist hedge fund much easier. You have a lot of experience in that space. But frankly speaking, it was very hard for me to imagine jumping out of bed every day <laughs> to want to push around large Japanese companies, something I kind of did indirectly for basically three decades of my career. Rather, I thought, well, why don't you know the collective three of us take the experience and the knowledge we had in areas related to good governance practices, diversity, mainly gender diversity, and also what does Japan really need to grow? And we thought, well, it does need more innovation. And I think today's topic of the discussion is creativity to thrive. And so why not integrate these principles? Now we call it ESG, but it wasn't, didn't have an acronym when we started working on these issues decades ago. But isn't it the case in the world that we're living today with so much uncertainty and so much scarce resources and so much inequity that perhaps the key to growth is in fact what we now call ESG. 
And why don't we apply those principles to startups, i.e. Uh, harder to change uh, adult companies, big companies, but perhaps easier to try to integrate these values at, at, when you're a teenager. So these companies that we're meeting every day, um, they're, they're not perfect in any, in, in any way. They're still growing, they're still developing, but we've been very positively surprised at how open and progressively their minded they are about ESG. So that's the journey we've chosen. Um, we still have to prove ourselves, of course, but very excited and we're learning something every day, which is fun. Thank you, thank you. Uh, you know, we're gonna talk about uh, your, you know, um, deeper thought about uh, why uh, ES is important in uh, startups later, but anyway. So Tom Kelly. Tom is, uh, again, the, my, one of my uh, partner at uh, uh, D4B Design for Ventures. But before that, uh, I mean, currently he's also at the partner of uh, uh, IDEO, uh, which the IDEO, uh, you know, came up uh, uh, with the idea of uh, uh, design thinking. And uh, the he, idea has been founded by, by his, uh, his, his brother, uh, David Kelly. So now um, uh, he's a partner with me uh, for uh, D4B. So Tom, tell me, that uh, your personal story about, um, and also the, uh, uh, he's a promoter of uh, idea of uh, design thinking all over the world, he's a spokesman. But anyway, so please tell me your story about uh, the uh, idea days or, uh, and, uh, and also creativity and the design thinking, and now you get in a bushi in Japan. Sure. Um, thanks, Mac. Happy to happy to do that. Also, before we start, I just want to say I'm honored to be on a panel like this with the three of you. I feel super lucky to be in the same room with you, or at least virtually, and so happy to be here. But to answer your question, Mac, um, I'm kind of in, in my current life uh, working with you at D4V. I'm kind of living inside of three circles that that like kind of tell the history of my career. Circle number one is the Japan circle. I first came to Japan in 1985 and just fell in love. It was Kyoto at the time. And I've been back to Japan every year since 85, sometimes 12 times a year until 2021. And so it looks like unless the Japanese government changes things pretty dramatically, I'm, I'm gonna miss this year. But so uh, I have just been so interested in and in love with Japan you know, for decades. Right, and so that's like one part of my current working life with IDEO Tokyo and D4V. Um, the second one is design. Uh, I've been uh, 33 years with my firm IDEO and just design in all of its form and design as it relates to innovation and design thinking and, and really transformation. Um, and so that's been really fun uh, working with so many creative people. But then the third part uh, uh, came, involved somebody in this room. Uh, in in um, 2016, five years ago, I had this very memorable breakfast at the Cerulean Tower Hotel um, with Mac Takano right there and Mamoru Taniya, where they said, hey, why don't we, uh, why don't we start a venture fund? And uh, I said, yes, right away. And um, it took us a little while to set it all up. But uh, since then, really because of Mac and Tania-san, IDEO now has three lines of business, three elements of our kind of purpose in the world. One is the design consultancy business that everyone knows us for. One is a learning business. Um, and then the third is investing. And we now see investing in startups is one of our greatest opportunities to make positive impact on the world. So I've got the Japan circle, the design circle, and uh, the investing circle all coming into one place that brings me here to D4V and here to G1 Global today. Thank you very much. Now, John, uh, you know, John, uh, uh, I met uh, John in the Silicon Valley maybe four or five years ago, and uh, his presentation was very uh, interesting. And uh, in fact, it's very fun. So in particular, his story about the tofu, right? That's, that's very interesting. So I wanna share that, that part as well, John. You bet. So just for context, um, I'm, I'm really glad to be with Kathy and Tom and also Mac because and I'm sorry, not there. You might've heard me typing really quickly because there are people online. So if you want to have questions, you can use the chat. I can respond to you immediately. So we can talk that way or we can do, use room stuff. Um, so this is the uh, this is some um, a picture of uh, my 
parents had a tofu store, uh, Tofia. And um, so I grew up in a Tofia. And so uh, I realized what the nature of hard work, uh, Japanese style, this kind of shokunin damashi, I, I, I lived it as a child. And maybe most Japanese people don't know how tofu is made. So Mac asked me if I could sort of walk you through that. So first of all, there are soybeans and the soybeans are saturated with water, soybean seed. Uh, this usually came from United States, Arkansas, uh, Kansas. I lived there, we, we were in Seattle, Washington. So it was from states I never heard of and it was exciting. Um, and um, it's mashed, it's boiled and um, it's boiled and then it becomes white. So it looks like milk. So we say soy milk, it's because it looks like milk, um, but it's got a lot of um, bean mash in it. So you have to filter it. So you can see here, there's a, a kind of filtration uh, layer. Uh, and then uh, it, what's added is uh, nigari, uh, which is able to change the pH of the soy milk. So it begins to coagulate, same way that cheese is made. And then it's placed into a, a box that's lined uh, with silk, kind of silk-like, um, and you place it in there and then you press it. And when you press it, you press it with many heavy things. And so when I was a kid, I had many muscles uh, because I'm carrying heavy, heavy things, uh, heavy rocks, heavy, everything has to be heavy to push the water out of the tofu. And then in the end, uh, it becomes a large sort of block that you sort of like cut into little blocks. And when people wonder, you know, how do you tell if the tofu is good? You can tell it because it's hand cut versus by a, versus a machine. So that's something I learned as a child. Uh, and I promised Mac I would cover that background. <laughs> so if you have any tofu questions in the uh, the channel, uh, I'm ready for you. Thank you. Okay. So by the way, the, the, you you been uh, oh, you want to say something? Uh, you just reminded me when I was growing up in California, John, we had a mm. tofu man in Salinas, California, a Nikkei tofu producer who would come in with a his uh, station wagon with cold tofu in the back of his station wagon Very good. and yeah. cut blocks mm. for each of the Nikkei farmers. And we put out a Tupperware every Thursday. So you were ah, like part that. Of that. Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah. Tupperware, sorry, tofu. Anyways, yeah, that's right. The tofu, tofu panel. Uh, no, sorry, this is not tofu panel, but uh, <laughs> uh, creativity <laughs> and the startups. Let's move to the creativity part, okay? So I can I want to come back to uh, uh, to John about the creativity because you have you you connected the uh, you know, IT with uh, design which is very create create so I will come back to you later but as uh, Tom maybe in terms of creativity you are the kind of authority of uh, creativity how uh, why do you think that the creativity or design is important uh, uh, in uh, uh, economy or do you see any evidence? Sure, um, Mike, there's tons of evidence. Um, and, and I think the, that link between design and uh, commercial success is um, maybe more practiced or better understood in the US, but it's there everywhere. Uh, and there's, there's lots of data. McKinsey um, did a study a while back that they said uh, what they called design-centric companies had to, had um, double the revenue and shareholder value growth as the non-design oriented companies. Um, there's um, oh, there's a NEA study of, of uh, startups saying that 87% of the design oriented startups believe that design contributed higher sales. And then there's just the, the success stories and especially in the startup community. You know, if you just look at like, most many of the of the successful startups, the you know, if you go back to Apple, we worked with Apple pre IPO. It was a startup, but you know, more recently, if you look at Airbnb or Pinterest or you know any of a dozen other you know unicorns, these multi billion dollar companies, for for lots of companies, design is a central element. And so I think design and creativity is really a driver. I'm not sure that it always was, but it, it certainly has been in this age of, of uh, 
of you know apps or user interfaces that drive company success. Okay, and John, uh, you know, again that you were I, I, you know, uh, before coming to this panel, I uh, watched uh, many times your TED the sto story. So you've been uh, all the time talking about the design, creativity, and also like uh, IT and innovation. How how do you connect that uh, innovation, IT with uh, design and also creativity? Yeah, well, um, I was a researcher at MIT's Media Lab for like 15 years. Then I became the president of Rhode Island School of Design, which is kind of like Musashi no Bijutsu Daigaku. So I, I lived both the worlds of MIT and kind of a real real art school. And then I went to Kleiner Perkins Venture Capital in Silicon Valley as the first design partner. And I guess my conclusion at the time was because of the iPhone, um, com com um, computing became consumerized, which already happened in Japan earlier with the um, Docomo and the iApplies and their whole ecosystem. But the, the iPhone became available to many more people than the Japanese mobile platforms. And that required a different level of experience design. And that's what unlocked the design boom, the mass consumerization of computers. But I'd seen it in research. I saw some of it in design. I saw it later in Silicon Valley and venture capital. And that was in 2013. I see. So okay, I think in terms of creativity, uh, as uh, your long-term experience as a, a strategist, do you wanna um, add? Well, I, I think at, at its core, you know, what is creativity? To me, it is um, new ideas, uh, innovative ways of thinking, of behaving. And so to me, it is um, directly correlated usually with um, some kind of, you know, commercial or economic impact. And so if you believe that definition, then to create more creative, to make more creativity, to make more innovation, uh, you really need to think about. So, are these coming from robots and machines, or are they coming from humans? And if they're coming from humans, then what kind of humans are, are we talking about? So, part of my work in, you know, womenomics and okay, it's mainly focused on gender diversity, but we all know there's different definitions of diversity. But it's all about, you know, how do you come up with new ways of doing things or new products that weren't existing yesterday or today. If you are in a room with like-minded people, it's very hard to come up with those ideas. So I think this real uh, priority or importance placed on uh, different ways of thinking, different mindsets is so relevant for this topic that we're speaking about today because without that difference of opinion, and yes, difference of opinion create tension, but usually that tension is uh, necessary to break out of uh, legacy behaviors, habits, and practices so that we can you know, crack the mold and do something different. Okay, let's, uh, uh, let's talk about uh, the Japanese, well, Japanese uh, companies uh, about the creativity and also like uh, how to uh, you know, grow going forward. So, uh, uh, for that matter, I'd like to uh, discuss the, about the history of Japan, because uh, 40 and 50 years ago, Japan was uh, known as an entrepreneur country, right? We had a Sony, we had a, a Honda, you know, they came uh, as a, one of our startups, but now no more, at least uh, um, except some of our exception, but uh, so uh, does that mean that the Japan, Japanese is uh, not creative enough or not? Maybe, Tom, do you want to start? Um, this thing people say more in Japan than outside of Japan, that like Japan's not creative. I'm hoping to live to, to, the, to the moment in which people stop saying that. I, I, I don't think it's true. But um, I know there's um, a lingering belief that um, there's lots of data that says Japan might be the most creative country uh, in the world. Uh, and I can cite some of that there. But um, 
But the interesting thing to me as somebody who's traveled to Japan so frequently, you know, I wrote a book that in English is called Creative Confidence. In uh, Japan, it's called Create of Mind the You know, and, um, and it's about these two things. It's about being creative and having confidence in that. And I'm pretty sure it's just the last bit. It's not the absence of creativity in Japan. Uh, it's the absence of confidence in one's creativity. So there's this really detailed um, survey done each year. It's called Global Entrepreneurial Monitor. And I, I, I read it carefully each year. Sadly, in the most recent survey, Japan did not participate. But last time they did, Japan was last in the world. Of, it's not all countries, but let's say 100 countries participate. And the question was, do you think you're highly innovative or not? And Japan was lowest in the world on self-perception of being innovative. So one out of 10 people, like in Brazil and Guatemala, seven out of 10 people said, yeah, I'm pretty innovative. Um, and so I don't think it's a crisis of creativity. I think it's a crisis of confidence. And we just need to kind of celebrate the great creativity of Japan and get everybody to believe it's true. And as soon as you believe it's true, then you can act a little differently. You know, uh, this is the topic of my book. If you, if you embrace your own creative confidence, then you can kind of move forward with it. So. Thank you. So John, uh, you have a nice picture, uh, Sony versus Sam Samsung. So we've been talking about that the Korea in recently very creative and we a little bit envy. Uh, they are, you know, K-pop and uh, uh, movies. So John, you wanna talk about uh, Samsung versus Sony? Yeah, well, um, just to, to build on what Tom was saying first, the, the idea of creativity, of saying that Asia is not creativity comes from the West. So, so just want to be very clear that it's a way to distinguish us versus them, number one. And number two, there really is two kinds of creativity. One is lateral creativity and one is deep creativity. And Japanese excel at deep creativity, which is tied to execution. So why would Steve Jobs be jealous of Sony? Steve Jobs was jealous of Sony's ability to execute creatively to a precision, but also high definition. That is a kind of creativity that is very unique to the Japanese mindset, which isn't fully understood or appreciated. So going back to what Tom's saying, creative confidence already exists. It's already called the, the, the respect for a shokunin. That is creativity. Uh, Sony and Samsung, I consulted for both Sony and Samsung, Sony during its like heyday in the 80s and 90s, and also Samsung afterwards later. And the thing that struck me about Samsung, and I tried to understand why it was so successful. And I was with one of the senior executives in the display division. And he told me this story that always stuck with me. He said, well, you know, Sony was like, you know, top 10 and we were like number 37 or something. And so what we decided was, well, you know, Sony releases a, a, a product line each year. So what we'll do at Samsung is we'll release products twice a year. Mm. So increase the cadence of product development twice a year, just by working twice as hard, which people would say like, oh, that's not a very creative way to win but it's how Japan won post-World War II. It was iterating much faster and Samsung just iterated way faster. And iteration, as we know from Silicon Valley, Mac, from everything that you've been a proponent of, iteration is a, is a way we create much faster, more relevant to a customer. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Cassie, um, you know, the John mentioned about the, uh, uh, I put the bus as the uh, you know, I, I'm old. Uh, before that, uh, we had a, a, a Walkman, right? Walkman in the uh, late 80s. So we created that kind of uh, things. But now, uh, you know, at least consumer product, uh, we do not much have such a product see, uh, in the world. So do you, do you think that the Japanese company changed a lot? Or what is the issue that Japan cannot make uh, such a creative uh, uh, product? Well, for, first of all, I tend to agree with Tom's comment earlier that it's not as if 
Japan does not have creativity. I mean, any country that can produce Pokemon to Takyu bean to Tadako flavored potato chips is pretty darn creative to me. But I think perhaps that, you know, like the cell phone example you uh, gave, it was very, very uh, popular amongst Japanese users, but was it able to be translated, you know, abroad? Uh, you mentioned about uh, K-pop and Korean entertainment in general. I'm just fascinated as to how this kind of miracle all of a sudden with a country less than half the population of Japan has really exploded, not just in K-pop, but in movies and in, in television. And what my Korean friends tell me is part of this is because the government, I think it was right after the Asian financial crisis in 1997, Kim Dae-jung, the president, basically had two goals for Korea. Number one was IT and number two was culture, meaning they were gonna back Korean culture, cultural exports to the rest of the world. So it's not that Japan doesn't have that creativity. I think it has lots of it, but how do you export that? How do you translate those products, those services, those models to fit the rest of the world's needs? And I have full confidence that that can be possible. It just needs a little bit of uh, support and help. Thank you. So John, you have a nice chart. What is that? Oh, well, this chart is, you know, so I'm, I'm now in the resilience space and resilience technology. And resilience means you have to be able to survive death if possible. So uh, that's for personal life, but also company lives too. So this is a chart uh, of the S&P 500 and the average lifespan of a company. And the data showed that the older companies, um, the, the older you are, it used to be you lived a long time. But now, and you know, as we, we as we came into the 21st century, companies die sooner. And as you know, companies don't like to die, especially shareholders don't like that. So, but that uh, doesn't apply to Japan, right? Well, you had a great example, Tom, about thousand-year companies in Japan. <laughs> Yeah, so you can look this up. You don't have to take my word for it. Check out Wikipedia. More than half of the companies in the world that are more than a thousand years old are here in Japan. In fact, the five oldest companies in the world are all Japanese. Three of them are hotels, by the way. So um, Japan is very, very good at that. And I would say you gotta be pretty creative if you can find a way to keep a traditional business alive for a thousand years. So then uh, one of the conclusion would be like uh, the, uh, we like a uh, big corporation to die sooner in Japan or not? Is that too, too much? <laughs> but, but anyway, that, you know, that the one of the conclusion is that uh, we expect uh, the more for startups rather than a big corporation in terms of creativity. Let's move the, 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 the topic to startups, okay? So uh, in order for uh, the uh, startups um, uh, all over the world to be uh, more uh, creative, that what, what, what we need? Do you have any idea? Well, I think it's not rocket science. Um, I think you need talent, you need capital, you need... Um, technology, because I think technology is uh, disrupting many sectors these days. And think about wh where we're all sitting here uh, in Japan today, it has plenty of all three. But yet, and I think you know, it was described earlier in an earlier session, um, Japan's in, in the space that we're operating today in venture capital, uh, why is it that Japan's, Japan's venture investing market is, depends on the year, but roughly 1 50th that of the United States? Yes, it's grown sevenfold in the last seven years, but a ver from a very, very tiny base. So when we're kind of thinking about how to solve for this problem, how to make Japan's venture ecosystem more vibrant mm -hmm. and more thriving, um, we believe that if startups can really integrate these pretty basic notions of good governance and worrying about 
your employees' well-being, because you want to limit turnover of your staff, because you want to recruit the best talent that you could possibly recruit. Over time, you're going to lower your cost of capital. You're going to recruit the best people. So hopefully that will translate into higher revenues. That should ultimately drive a more uh, vibrant ecosystem is our thesis. Mm -hmm. um, rather than, oh, this is a box ticking compliance exercise that somebody's told me I have to do because I'm gonna go public. No, no, no. This has to be part of your core you know, business strategy. And I think those companies that get it and implement that today, we will be able to see a much bigger and more successful and more global uh, venture market for Japan going forward. Yeah, I, I agree that. So, uh, Tom, you, you mentioned about the uh, uh, design uh, thinking uh, may work um, in startups world. How uh, do you see, you know, the how it works uh, in Silicon Valley and in Japan as a comparison? Sure. Uh, I mean, I think design is one element of it. I, I think that design has become a very strategic tool for uh, startups in the Silicon Valley and really elsewhere around the world. Um, so I think that's certainly one element of it. I, I think Kathy's list was really good. I mean, we, we do need, even though venture capital has increased, I think we need uh, we need more. Um, you know, in the Silicon Valley, if you come up with a, a, a company that has some promise, you can just more or less know that you'll get funding, right? It may be, you know, the, not exactly the terms you want, but you know you will get funding. And we're not there in Japan, right? The, the, that sense of, you know, if you build it, they will come. You, you, um, there's just not, um, there's not quite enough, um, what they call risk capital, Right. And so this this does have to do with, you know, that there's the trade off of of risk and reward is in there. And then uh, just to add one to Kathy's list, I would say um, societal support for um, for entrepreneurship. You know, there is a sense that you mentioned earlier of like what mom and dad really want is for you to work for the biggest, you know, most familiar listed company. Um, in Japan, I, I may have some of you may have heard me tell the story earlier, but um, several years ago at a slush uh, uh, event in Tokyo, I had an entrepreneur tell me. He said, "Look, Tom, it's it's harder to get a girlfriend in Japan if you work at a startup." And you know, I, I laughed, but then I thought, "Wait, no, that's real, right? If you think." that you know, your girlfriend's parents are never gonna let you marry her if you, you know, if you work for this startup they never heard of, that is a barrier to entry. That you know, gets people where it hurts. That's a very human, human thing. And so we do need society. We need the parents really when they, when we think about you know, uh, the emphasis in schools and stuff like that to you know, do more uh, STEM or creativity um, uh, courses in school and then to support entrepreneurship, you know, both of my kids have worked in startups, and I think that's great. And and so I think if Japanese moms and dads saw that as a, you know, as an admirable thing, this shows up at the in the um, global entrepreneurship monitor as well. Respect for entrepreneurship is lower uh, among adults in Japan than most other places in Asia. And so um, yes, I think the societal support in Japan is a non-trivial part of the equation. That's interesting. So John, uh, you, you have uh, any comment on? Uh, um, yeah, well, I've been thinking a lot. Thank you so much for having me at this, <laughs> Mac. It's sort of amazing. Um, so um, I realized that, so we can describe solutionist versus problemist. Someone good at a solution, someone good at a problem. You say a strategist is good at look, working at the problem. A shokunin works on the solution, the, the master executor. And we talked about blue bottle before this call. So Japanese solutionists created the idea of the drip pour. But Silicon Valley capitalists who are also solutionists create companies. <laughs> so they created scale. So it's a different kind of ex, uh, exercising of a kind of creativity that solutionist versus problemist. Going to problemist, you mentioned Sony and the Walkman. The Walkman could never have been invented in America 
because American houses are too big. So you would never need a portable stereo. So when you think about the brilliance of the Walkman, a problemist strategist found a problem unique to Japan. Think about Japan and Docomo and mobile phones. There are so many people who are traveling on the trains every morning. So there was a problem that the solutionists developed. So I think Japan is good at both finding the problem and finding the solution. So I would say it's a full stack country, is my belief. Oh, who? Asking the comment on the slide. Oh, yeah. Please, please uh, make a comment on slides. Yeah. You see some uh, slide. Oh, slide. Oh, yeah. So uh, right now, um, I'm working on the problem of death, of like human death because of disasters. You know, COVID is big in the news. But actually, um, a lot of people die all the time. It just didn't happen in this decade. It happens over a century. So if you think of the Spanish H1N1 flu, sort of down here at the bottom, um, 30 million deaths compared to how many COVID has had so far. So death is a big problem. And I'm a solutionist working in the death space for either companies and their mortality or people and their mortality. So I love this problem as someone who can make things. Interesting. I highly recommend it. <laughs> that was quotable quotes from John Maeda. Death is a big problem. So yes, let's not forget that. That's right. <laughs> so Kathy, uh, now uh, uh, you are in uh, uh, VC space. And um, is that the investing in Japan only or globally? We're investing in both, mainly awesome. Japan, uh, middle to late stage startups, and also overseas. Okay, when you see the the startups in Japan uh, and with other countries, the, what, how do you see the difference and in opportunity and also like a, a issue or program? Well, um, just from my personal vantage point, I see no difference in levels of passion. I think there are really passionate entrepreneurs um, here in Japan as passionate as we would find outside. What I think may be slightly different, again, there are some exceptions, perhaps in our, you know, we've only started in May, is that A, the teams are pretty undiverse, the leadership teams of Japanese startups. So you can guess on a Zoom call, you know, most of us on our team are female. Most of them on the other side are, are male. Um, and not just male, but kind of a particular type or, uh, or background, education and otherwise. And then B is, although there are exceptions, many of them think Japan is a sufficiently big market. We're just focused on Japan. And to my earlier comment, I think there's an earlier uh, session that touched on this about you know, as a startup, of course, you're just focused on day-to-day -day survival, and it's natural that you're focused on your home market. That's true. But I think it would be great to see more companies like Merukari or is it Smart News that start thinking about going outside of Japan earlier. Because if you do that, then you automatically need to think, okay, who's going to run those overseas businesses? Who's going to expand our footprint overseas? You automatically have to start thinking of a different type of human capital or personnel strategy. Um, I think we're moving in that direction, which is encouraging to see, but um, I think we could we could use more. What, what they need more, like, uh, support from government or capital or like a mindset? I don't think it's necessarily support from government. I think it is, um, you know, of, of course, as Tom was pointing out, risk capital, particularly for this later stage, which is precisely one of the reasons why we're focused on later stage, because there is not a lot of risk capital at that stage of, this, of, the, of the investing spectrum. But I think it's also just having grown up, many of these entrepreneurs are very young in their 20s and 30s, their whole lives have been in deflation, right? Their whole lives have only known prices and wages go down, not up. And so naturally, there's this kind of tendency to kind of look within as opposed to, you know, um, even experience or having experiences going abroad. Um, but again, I think there are exceptions. What we're really encouraged to see is that more talent 
from investment banks, from Goldman Sachs, from McKinsey, from BCG, many, many people in those very kind of established traditional industries for frankly, you know, um, a particular socioeconomic class perhaps, but they're now flowing into the startup uh, space which I think is precisely one of the perhaps missing elements, right? They have passionate entrepreneurs, but you know, if you don't have a solid like CFO or C CTO, then it's kind of hard to get your business really off the ground. So that's really, really um, encouraging. Yeah. And one more thing on the capital side, what is very exciting to see is foreign investors, be it um, you know, large hedge funds, large private equity funds, large long only institutional money is now sniffing around Japanese <laughs> ventures because they see American valuations are sky high, Chinese valuations are kind of up there, and Japan, like nobody knows about Japanese startups. And so they're beginning to sniff around. So if any of you have startups that you think are gonna be interesting to uh, foreign capital, I think that now is your, now is your opportunity. Tom, uh, you know, as a uh, GP of uh, D4V, you see uh, many of uh, startups in Japan. In particular, and also you are in a, a Silicon Valley parallel to, you know, the startups there. So what, what do you think that they need? I mean, a, a Japanese startup need more to grow. Uh, I mean, there's a few elements, but one, you know, I, I agree with Kathy that this idea of having a global outlook from the beginning, I think it's really important. And as you know, Mac, it's something we look for uh, at D4V. Um, uh, and you know, the, the size of the domestic market in Japan um, is both a blessing and a curse, I think. Because if you start a company in Israel or in Sweden or whatever, you know, we're gonna go international right away. Um, whereas in Japan, there's, there's enough runway. And then I, I think for some companies, and thankfully, you know, this is not true for all of our portfolio companies, but for some companies, they, they're just kind of bumping up against the limit of that. Like, it's so different, you know, like going overseas and maybe they don't have a staff that has the language abilities. And I, I think it might be a, a bigger hurdle for some Japanese companies than it is for some companies located elsewhere in the world. So if you kind of start from the beginning, like, well, of course we're gonna go overseas because we wanna grow, uh, you know, beyond the limits of a single, uh, country, if you start that way from the beginning and have that in your mind and start thinking about your the team you're building and who's going to help us with that global thing, I think that positions you better uh, for that that leap that you know we hope many or most of our companies will eventually make. Thank you, John. Uh, you know, uh, oh. looking at the Japan from uh, outside of uh, Japan, what do you think that the Japan particular startups need uh, to be a more uh, vibrant economy or company? Uh, well, Mac, you know, I'm such a big fan of Torasan. <laughs> uh, because Torasan, you know, why was he such a popular character year over year? Was it like 20 or 30 seasons of it? But it's because he was uh, a regular dumb person from the countryside could never succeed, mm -hmm. but he was a character that had wonderful empathy and warmth for his family, for his neighborhood, but he's also a tragic character because he leaves town every time at the end of every movie. And I think it's an example of how, we, we mentioned Sony and Honda, like both are examples, the founders left Japan, went to America to understand not just the, the world, but Japan itself. And it gave them a wonderful outsider perspective coming back. And as every Japanese person who has left Japan and come back knows you get treated differently and you're not treated essentially well. And it's this kind of resilience that you have professionally that makes you unique. Like I saw on Twitter, there's a uh, Tagawa Kinya in the audience over there, uh, is an interesting person who left Japan, went to the UK, came back and saw the value of having the outsider perspective. But just like Torasan, 
you never get to feel comfortable even in your own home. Thank you. So it's time for us to have a question from the audience. So please raise your hand from, okay, please. And please try to speak within the 30 minutes, 30 seconds. Oh, thank you for the discussion. So if I made a question to Tom, so due to the hitting the COVID-19, the we are very limited meet, you know, it's an accidental encounter, right? So meet the new people. So that is, I think that that is a, is a very, you know, damage to the create new, new things, I think. So do you have any solution or tips uh, how to increase, you know, it's a creativity that even in the working from home? Okay, go on. Sure. So what you're talking about is what we would call a serendipitous meeting where you bump into somebody and they tell you something they're doing and you say, oh, you know what that reminds me of and you, you build on things. And um, that is what I miss most about my former work life is that ability to kind of bump into people and you create something new very frequently. I mean, it turns into something of value. And um, I don't have a perfect solution, but we do have one, one thing that we use very widely at IDEO and it's called Donut Buddies. I think it's actually a company, I think, where it um, randomly assigns somebody else in the company for you to meet with. Uh, once a week, we do it. And so I've been doing it with IDEO Tokyo there's about 40 people and I've met with all of them, literally every person in the office during the pandemic, just one-on-one. -on -one. And sometimes we talk about business and sometimes we don't, but sometimes I really help them with their project. Um, um, I had one in the US where someone was working on something of some immersive experience and she'd never heard of Team Lab. And I said, oh, you gotta go see Team Lab, right? They're the best in the world at that. And so, so she did, there's an exhibit here in the US right now. And so, um, yeah, we need to find some way of doing that, but it's other than those um, arranged things like the donut meetings, um, there's no donuts involved, by the way, it's just the name of the company. Uh, 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 it's hard to, um, yeah, it's hard to do the serendipitous meeting. You're right, it's a, it's a big issue. Thank you. Yes, you I just wanted to add, because you reminded me, Tom, of, um, you probably all know, uh, Matsumoto san, the former chairman of Karubi, um, Japan's probably most successful snack oyatsu maker. And the question to him was, how can Karubi come up with such crazy oyatsu like all year round? And I think they had at one point 40% shelf market share of kombini. I mean, huge. And he said, well, one of the tricks they did was I'm not sure if it's all their offices, but I actually watched a documentary about this particular office. So when the employees came to work every day, they took their ID card and there was a tanmatsu, uh, a pad, and they put their ID card, it goes, ping, Suki-san, kyo no seki wa A16. It basically assigned everybody randomly where they were gonna sit that day. And they all carry their laptop and their pen case and they'd move to whatever location. So one day, Takano-san could be the head of uh, Agil sales. The other day, I could be sitting next to the head of you know, uh, HR department. In other words, it broke down silos. So I'm not answering your question about what to do under COVID if, if we continue to work from home forever. But if we get some kind of going back to work, do we go back to the way we used to work with silos? Or do we try to mix things up a little bit? I know this is probably impractical for most organizations, but I always thought when I saw that, like at Goldman, like I'd only run into people in other divisions, women in the toilet, you know? <laughs> when other opportunities do you have to do this? So I think kind of rethinking the way that we work, if we do all go back you know, to work in the, in, in the traditional sense at some point might be one idea, but I thought that was really, really interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. So uh, other questions? One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, please. Hi, so this is a question for Tom. Um, you mentioned you fell in love with Japan in Kyoto, and we all know this gorgeous traditional Japanese design aesthetic. 
which also inspired people like Steve Jobs to create the Apple user experience. Why did Japan never manage to master user experience considering they have such a deep and beautiful design heritage? That's a good question. Well, that's a kind of a loaded question too. I mean, let me just say the user experience of the country is probably the best in the world. So it's not, I think you're not giving yourself enough credit. I think some people would call that omotanashi, but uh, so I, it's been my great privilege to working at IDEO to send, I don't know, a couple of hundred people to Japan for their first trip. And let me just say zero, zero of them came back and said, yeah, didn't really like it. I mean, a hundred percent of people on their first trip didn't, you know, love Japan. So um, there's something that's really, really right uh, about it. And if Japan is slightly behind on digital transformation, as Kono-san was saying in the first session today, there's time to catch up. Um, we, we shouldn't wait any longer. Let's do that as soon as possible. But um, yeah, I'm not counting Japan out on anything related to the, the human experience of, of Japan. Can I add to that one? Yeah, please. Um, uh, thanks for asking that question because I haven't thought about it in a long time. Uh, I would attribute to just the English language. The language barrier has prevented Japanese from succeeding at UX in a way that's significant because if you remember, there were two brands of workstation that were doing well. One was the Sun workstation. The other was the Sony News workstation. Uh, so both were built on uh, uh, um, 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 Berkeley, uh, UC Berkeley uh, Unix core. Um, the, the Sony news workstation was created by Japanese engineers who could read English really well, but it was only a small minority of people. So Sony could never scale their news business because programming is in English. So I think the language barrier prevented Japan from succeeding. That's my thought. And that's true. So pick on Hi, thank you. Uh, this is Yasuo Naito from Japan Forward. Uh, Japan Forward is created by the several, you know, crazy people in Sankei Shimpun, the old newspaper. And we're on, on the mission to transform the old newspaper to the newly kind of media style. If you uh, have any advice to, you know, this type of new media, uh, please. Thank you. Change gender stereotypes. <laughs> yeah, if you want another idea is I would say don't, um, don't funnel people into reading only their quote favorite articles. I fell into a trap of doing this. I was using a news aggregator I will not name. And I realized after reading that, that like every day for maybe six weeks, it was pointing me, it was trying to make me angry. It, it was every article, I just filled a screen full of articles and says, doesn't this make you angry? Doesn't this, doesn't this? And it was because they were just trying to feed me things that they thought might engage, might not make me happy, but engage my attention. And so, um, you know, so I've switched to publications that don't do that. So um, I would say, yeah, don't try to optimize for just um, attention or it turns out anger is a really good way to do that, but try to like help your readers be more informed about the world or, you know, kind of learn more on a day-to-day -day basis. So we need to take a few more. Uh, hello, this is Suhas. Uh, this is about, uh why the Japanese startup companies are not that much successful. Uh, as one of the panelists already mentioned about the language barrier. So uh, how to go about uh, considering this important hurdle in future, if you want to significantly grow uh, the startup uh, thing in Japan? I mean, I, I can partly answer that. Um, one is, I mean, if you're patient enough, um, you do that through the school system. 
right? The, the um, you know, my wife is Japanese and she um, really, she had studied English in college, but she never really, um, her school didn't require to speak it at all, right? And so you can start with school, but gee, that takes a long time. Um, but I think um, uh, developing, there are all these ed tech apps that are very, very helpful around the world. We had three, I think three unicorn ed tech companies in the last year in the, in the US, uh, Duolingo, Udemy and, and Coursera. Um, and so I would say take that on as a challenge as a startup. How might we raise the, the um, English language ability of, of um, Japanese entrepreneurs so that they were able to, so that it wasn't a barrier, right? And so I think that's a, you know, um, John talked about problemists and solutionists. That's a, that's a, that's a problem to be solved. I think the Japanese culture is too highly evolved and therefore all the problems have been solved. So that's why I think, and also because Japan has become more isolationist, it's not exposed to enough problems. And so I think getting more people out of Japan is going to help improve that perception to become more global problemist versus local problemist, because most of the problems Japanese will find in Japan really don't matter because they've already been solved so well. Thank you. So last person, sorry, we have already a uh, host person. Okay, th okay th thank you. So um, the question to Kathy. So that while well, you are doing the businesses for the uh, ESG related venture capitals at uh, this moment. So um, do you think that team of ESG related investment is able to get um, that uh, good evaluation from the you know, capital market. Because of that, um, the world of ESG itself is very vague, maybe, so my understanding. So that, well, um, do you have any formula to evaluate that ESG uh, value for that, you know, your investment? Sure, so you're right that it's, it seems very vague or there are many, many definitions and frameworks and standards for ESG globally. But at, at its essence to us, um, how startups, which we're targeting, should be um, thinking about ESG is what in those buckets of environment, social, and governance matter the most to their core businesses, right? Because if it's not relevant enough to their day-to-day -day activity, then it's irrelevant, right? So they need to figure out their own, what we call materialities. What are the most material factors within those ESG buckets? And then start to think about a roadmap, like set KPIs, set goals. So let's take a simple example, board diversity. Most Japanese startup boards, as you can guess, are pretty undiverse. And so what is the goal? Particularly if they're later stage and they're thinking about going public, or getting acquired, they probably do need to think seriously about this topic, right? So to, to us, that's really the, the critical thing. We as an investor are not forcing any startup to do X, Y, Z. They've got to figure out what's most important for them and their needs, right? And I think, of course, in this day and age, we're seeing a lot of articles every day about greenwashing, right? It's such a popular term. Oh, if I say that I do a little bit of ESG on the side, I'm gonna command a valuation premium, um, things like that. That's very dangerous. So I think it's also very important to be genuine and to be honest with the market, the in investing market, about what you're actually uh, doing and caring about and communicating what you do to the outside world. And that's kind of where we come in to help with measurement, measurement resources, communication strategies, that kind of thing. Yeah. And again, no startup, no big company is perfect at ESG, let alone startups. Nobody is, is perfect from the get-go, but we're trying to help them on that, on that journey and partner with them. Thank you very much. Uh, we, uh, we just the time is up. Uh, thank you for uh, John and Tom and Cassie for your participants. That was very really a good panel. So please give a big hand to our panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you.